look at the New Testament and the record of the uh, life of Jesus, and we ask this question, what negative prohibition did Jesus utter more frequently than any other negative prohibition? The answer is simple because this particular commandment was uttered so many times by Jesus that it was way ahead of whatever is in second place. And if you're thinking now in your mind, racking your brain, trying to figure it out, let me help you by putting it on the board here. It was two words, fear not. In fact, Jesus says it so often that at times we miss the significance of it because it seems as if every time he uh, encounters his disciples, the first thing he says to them is, fear not, or don't be afraid. He says it so often it becomes almost like a greeting. Instead of hello or shalom, he's saying, don't be afraid. And I've wondered many times why Jesus did that so often, why he used those words so frequently. And I suspect that it has something to do with his knowledge, his intimate knowledge and understanding of the frailty of our human makeup. Because we as a people tend to be fearful. We tend to struggle with anxiety. Now there's a word that is often uh, misused in our vocabulary. You'll hear somebody say, oh, I'm so anxious for Christmas to come. And what they are saying, really, is that they are eager. They are joyfully anticipating this coming event. But what they've actually said when they said they're anxious is that they have some kind of fear about the arrival of Christmas. And so the term anxiety is often used as a substitute for the word eager, when in reality the term anxiety refers to a spirit of fearfulness or worry or apprehension about something that lies in the future. Now, everyone in the world has fear. We don't always fear the same things as other people fear, but we all experience anxieties and we all experience fears. I've often said as a minister, that when people go into the hospital, it doesn't matter uh, how insignificant the procedure is that they face, there's some kind of anxiety level that must be dealt with in the patient. It's just a uh, part of human nature to have anxiety about one's physical well-being when you enter into a place like a hospital. Anxieties can become intense and paralyzing, that the fear level in our uh, personalities can rise to the status of a phobia, and a phobia tends to be a kind of fear that paralyzes us in one way or another. Recently, I read a uh, study uh, that indicated the ten most uh, widely uh, experienced phobias among American people. And listed in that 10 most frequent phobias list uh, were things that included acrophobia, which is the fear of heights, xenophobia, which is the fear of foreigners or people that are different from ourselves, claustrophobia, fear of being in closely confined areas. But the number one fear on the list was the fear of speaking in front of a group. <laughs> and I looked at that and, and I said, well, I can relate to that because I have to do that quite frequently and I can't imagine uh, ever having the experience of uh, anticipating speaking without some kind of anxiety. You would think that somebody that speaks as often as I do uh, would never suffer from anxiety of public speaking. But I'll be honest with you, I, there's never a time that I don't have anxiety about speaking in front of a group. 
Uh, it's a scary thing. And some people are so terrified by it that they uh, are just simply unable to do it at all. But again, we have all these different kinds of anxieties, and these do relate to our relationship with God. Let me turn your attention to a portion of the Sermon on the Mount where I think everybody has uh, heard at one point or another, but we don't spend much time talking about it, where we say, uh, in, we find in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25, these words from Jesus. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, and sufficient for the day is its own troubles. Uh, long before I ever read the Bible for the first time, I was familiar with this passage in Scripture because it was one of my favorites or one of the favorite passages of my father. And I heard him quote it again and again, particularly at the dining room table. He would use the old version, be anxious for nothing, take no thought for tomorrow, what you should eat, what you should drink, what you should put on. The fact is we do worry about tomorrow. And our concerns about tomorrow often provoke a spirit of anxiety within ourselves. I think that uh, Jesus gave this sermon to a mixed audience of men and women, but it has particular relevance to the men who heard it. In our own culture, again, I saw a report from uh, a psychologist that said one of the most gripping anxieties for the average American man an anxiety that he rarely articulates, and when men gather together, they never speak of. They talk about sports, they talk about business, they talk about all of these things, but they don't open up and reveal the fears that they have, thinking that it's basically unmanly or something of that sort. And this gripping anxiety that the psychologists have, uh, have uncovered for the American man is the fear of failure to provide for his own household. That is, this is a problem specifically to married men and those who have children. Because the moment a man says, I do, in front of a minister or a justice of the peace, he has now taken upon himself, at least in our cultural understanding, the burden of caring not only for himself, but also for his wife and for the family. And even though we've now changed so much of the cultural uh, structures where many women are in the workplace and so on, still that age-old expectation of the male to be the one who is to be the provider for, and, for, and the protector of the family is still deeply rooted in the male psyche in our nation, and I suspect in many other nations as well. Another 
phenomenon that's reported to us from the uh, secular world of medicine is the strange ratio of the experience of nightmares. That men have twice as many nightmares as women. I mean, wonder why that men would have more nightmares than women. And again, the, uh, the consensus is that it's rooted in this particular fear or anxiety that the man carries around with him. Now, I'm sure women have their own distinctive sets of anxieties and worries that they have to be concerned about and also related to the care of their offspring, of their homes, and all of the rest. But when Jesus focuses his attention on this problem of anxiety, he's talking about the basic necessities of human life and the concerns and anxieties that we bring to bear on these provisions. Will I be able to feed my family tomorrow? Will I be able to clothe my family tomorrow? How am I going to accomplish all of these things? And Jesus says, take no thought for tomorrow. Now, he's not saying, don't be provident. He's not saying, don't be prudent. For elsewhere in the Scriptures, we are told that the man who fails to provide for his household is worse than an infidel, and that we are supposed to be wise and prudent and disciplined in making provisions for our family. So Jesus is not giving a prohibition here against careful planning and against provisions. He's making a prohibition against our spiritual attitudes with respect to these endeavors and these responsibilities. So he's not saying don't take any thought for tomorrow in terms of being uh, diligent to uh, provide for tomorrow. He's saying don't worry about tomorrow. You do what you have to do, but at the same time, Tomorrow is in the hands of God. And it really is our fear of the future more than anything else that drives anxieties and fears and worries. We don't worry ever about what happened yesterday. We don't have to worry about what happened yesterday because yesterday is over. We may worry about the consequences of what happened yesterday and how they will work out today or tomorrow. But once the moment has passed, our anxiety about it passes with it. And so we can understand at this point that the focal point of our worries and the focal point of anxiety is always the future. It's always about what has not yet taken place. I used to play a lot of golf, and I, I hit balls in some bad places. And I can remember one time being faced with a horrible situation where I had out of bounds on, on one side, water on the other side, and trees in front of me, and it just seemed like there was no safe way to proceed. And I took my shot, it hit the trees, bounced off the trees, into the water, and I was in big trouble. But I, I smiled at that time, and my golf partner says, how can you be happy? And I said, because it's over. <laughs> said, and, and the one thing I know is that I never will have to hit that shot again as long as I live. I may have to hit one like it, but not that same one. It's gone. There's nothing to fear when it's over. It's beforehand that we are gripped by anxiety because we don't know how difficult or painful or troublesome the problems that we face tomorrow will be. Now, when Jesus says to those who are gathered not to be anxious, not to worry, and he says you can't add uh, any size to your body by worrying about it, worry doesn't solve any problem, you, uh, and then he rebukes them for being of little faith. Now, why does he do that? When it is our nature to be concerned about things that, that could happen to us and that many things that can happen to us and will happen to us are worthy of fear. 
because there are fearful things out there. There are painful things that we may experience, and not all of our worries go unrealized. We can remember David saying, the thing I feared the most has come upon me. And yet at the same time, the pain of that thing that he feared the most is something that hurt him for many, many years before it actually happened. As we've been told that the, uh, the coward dies a thousand times, but the courageous person only once. But the coward goes through the experience by worrying about it and being frightened about it many, many times before the actual occurrence comes. And I can't think of too many things in my life that have happened to me, bad things that have happened to me, that actually were worse than what I thought they would be. Well, there are some. There were times when I went to the dentist's office where I didn't anticipate a whole lot of pain, where the pain was worse than I had anticipated. We've all been through that. But most of the time, that when we worry about things and when they happen, they're really not as bad as we thought they would be. And I think part of that is because God gives His grace to us in our hour of need in a way we don't really anticipate. So what this comes down to, theologically and spiritually, is a question of the relationship between the future, our fears of the future, and faith. Jesus said, why are you worried, ye of little faith? Our worries and anxieties really do come from a lack of trust in the promises of God. And we all have that. I mean, we all have faith, but our faith is limited, and sometimes our faith does not uh, get us past the anxiety of what will happen, because we're afraid that God will not do what He promises He will do. Or, on the other hand, we may be afraid that He will do what He promises He will. That's what scares me about God, is that because God calls us to live in a world that is filled with trouble, and he says in the world we will have tribulation, and we will have affliction, and we will have suffering. That's what scares me, is that his word will come to pass. But I have to hear, as we've already looked at in the problem of suffering, the other side of it, where God promises his presence and his grace to sustain us in the most difficult of human enterprises. And Jesus is saying, you don't have very much faith if you're gripped in anxiety because, and your lack of faith is a lack of faith in the promises of God, where God says, trust me for tomorrow. Trust me with your life. And that's what it means to be a Christian, is to trust God for your entire life. I have to trust God not only for what I eat and what I drink and what I put on, but I have to trust God for how I will die, when I will die, where I will die, and what will happen uh, to my family and all the rest when I die. I have to trust God for the future. And I think that... Uh, that the greatest cure there is, the simple cure, but it's not as simple as it seems, it's simple to understand, but it's difficult to apply, is that we need to immerse ourselves in the Word of God, because nothing dispels fear more quickly than the reinforcement and our understanding of the promises of God. Uh, and the knowledge of the presence of God. But we're afraid that He won't be there when we need Him, or that He won't do what He said that He would do. Now, 
as I said a few moments ago, there are all different kinds of anxiety, and they're related, as I said, to the future. And I'm going to distinguish among three types of fear or worry or anxiety that afflict us. The first is, is an objective, specific fear, as I've already mentioned, such as uh, uh, a phobia, where we're afraid of small places, or we're afraid of speaking, or we're afraid of dying, or we're afraid of, of pain, or afraid of the dentist, afraid of cats, afraid of snakes, afraid of spiders. Those are specific fears and anxieties that we have, and there are specific ways to deal with them, as we all know. But in distinction from that kind of fear, there's another kind of fear that can be extremely debilitating. And this is what the existential philosophers uh, spoke about frequently when they talked about the experience of angst, where they defined angst or anxiety as being a nameless fear. Uh, it, it, it's a condition that I think we've all experienced to one degree or another, where you're pacing around, your stomach is flip-flopping, your hands are shaking a little bit, you know that you're scared, you may be having an anxiety attack, and you have no idea why. This has to do with being frightened in general. And again, when the philosophers analyze that, they speak about this kind of fright, which can be so terrifying and paralyzing to us, as unspecific. We don't know why. That's why psychiatrists make money. Somebody will go to them and say, I'm suffering from anxiety, but I don't know what I'm afraid of. And the psychiatrist will have to probe and dig and try to sort out what it is that is troubling the person. Well, there can be all kinds of hidden things that are involved in this. I, I've told the story of the anxiety that I experience when I'm waiting for a friend or for my wife to arrive home and she's late. And she doesn't have to be an hour late for me to start getting nervous. If she's five minutes late, I start thinking. I start wondering. I start worrying. Where is she? What happened to her? Has she been in a traffic accident? You know, I, I start imagining all these things that could be uh, so terrible, and I'm, I get more and more anxious. And I remember once waiting for a, uh, a friend to arrive at my house, and he was not there on time, and I started pacing up and down in front of the window in my living room, uh, getting more and more nervous watching down the road to see if I could see his car coming. And in the midst of all of that, this, these words came into my mind. A watched pot does not boil. <laughs> You've heard that adage many, many times. You can look at that, that pot and look for the bubbles, and they'll never come as long as you're watching. You've got to get out of the room before the, the water will come to uh, boil. And <laughs> And all of a sudden, I had a vivid recollection of myself as a child, where every morning my father would leave for his business in downtown Pittsburgh, and my mother was his secretary. And so she went to work every day with him. And my grandmother lived with us, and she would see us off to school in the morning after my parents had gone. And every night, my father and mother would come back home at 6 o'clock, and we would plan for dinner at about 6.15, and my grandmother would be in the kitchen preparing the dinner. And about five minutes to six, I would find myself standing in front of the kitchen door, looking up the street, looking for my father's car. And if they did not come down the street by 6 o'clock, I would be in a panic. I was anticipating being an orphan. They're not coming home. Now this was the reaction of a child who was insecure about safety, who wanted his parents 
to be safe, to be alive and well, and to come home every day from work. And my grandmother would be standing by the stove watching me be anxious. And that's where she would say to me, a watch pot never boils, go in the other room, go play with something, you know, they're going to be here. She knew what I was worried about. And I thought, and here I am, a grown man, and I'm still pacing up and down in front of the window when somebody is late. That's just one of those things where things that occur to us as children can haunt us in many, many ways as long as we live. Because in some respects, we still are children, and we bear the scars of the things that frightened us as children even to this day. And I say that not to practice psychiatry without a license, but simply to say that when you have anxieties, and you don't know why you have those anxieties, take a look into the past. And it may help you discover why it is. But this nameless anxiety <coughs> is rooted in even a deeper fear. Again, it's the fear of the future. The existential philosophers have no uh, optimism about what tomorrow will bring. They're saying that what's provoking this anxiety, according to Martin Heidegger, is the experience of what he calls Geworfenheit, where he says modern man feels as if he's been hurled or thrown into a chaotic world. He has no meaningful beginning. He's emerged from the slime. He's a grown-up germ, and he is moving as the clock takes every moment to his annihilation. And so we're sort of suspended between birth and death in the context of a vortex of meaninglessness. And that's always eating away at us, according to these pessimistic existentialists. I would look at it a little differently from a Christian perspective, that this nameless anxiety may be more deeply rooted to what I'm going to call the third kind of anxiety, which is what we call simply restlessness. And this was addressed by St. Augustine. If you recall his prayer in his book of the Confessions when he wrote, O Lord, Thou hast made us for Thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in Thee. Now, restlessness is a kind of fear. Restlessness is the manifestation of a particular type of anxiety. It's nameless, according to the existentialists who talk about this amorphous type of angst or anxiety. Augustine names the child. He said that anxiety, that restlessness, is rooted in our basic estrangement and alienation from God because our lives are out of whack if we are estranged from God. And being outside of fellowship with God is a, an intense and powerful provocation to fear. We fear not only the Creator, but we fear His creation. We begin to fear life itself because we're not really in fellowship with the author of life and the Lord of all life. And the only way I know of to get over this is what Augustine said. Our hearts are going to stay restless until they find rest in you. This is what Jesus gave to His people. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you so that where I am, you will be also. So don't be afraid of the future. Don't be afraid of tomorrow because I'm taking care of tomorrow. That God is the God of tomorrow. Now, I'm leaving now. And they're going to get frightened. He says, but I'm going to leave something behind. I'm going to give you a legacy, an inheritance. And what was it? Peace 
I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. In other words, the peace that Jesus is talking about here is the opposite of restlessness. It is a calmness of spirit that comes when you are in fellowship with God and you can trust Him for tomorrow. He is the one who conquers fear. Now, at the same time as we have this negative prohibition, don't be afraid, we are also called to encourage one another as Christians. And what does it mean to encourage one another? It is helping another person to find courage. In many respects, I think one of the reasons the nation responded so positively to the Wizard of Oz is that we could identify with some of the characters, not the least of which was the Cowardly Lion. The Cowardly Lion represented our fearfulness, our anxiety. And what did he need to overcome his problem? He was looking for courage. He needed courage. And that's why we need to encourage one another, because we all need courage. Now, let me just finish by saying this. What is the one indispensable, necessary ingredient to have courage? What do you have to have, absolutely, before you can have courage? It's a sine qua non of courage, a necessary precondition for courage. You have to have it or you can't possibly have courage. You can have it and not have courage, but you can't have courage without having this. Here's what it is, folks. Fear. Why do I say that? Because it doesn't take any courage to do what you're afraid, what you're not afraid to do. Courage exists for those who have fear. To have courage is to do what you're anxious about, to do what you're afraid to do. And that's why we need to encourage one another, to help each other overcome the anxieties, the fears, the apathy.